you got the blood flowing uh, to the sitting areas uh, a bit again, because I heard the seats are rather hard. Um, let me just re reset it. Um, great to be here today. Uh, so many wrecked, interested people. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. Um, there have been a, a lot of great technical talks today, uh, and there are actually, we have a few more to go. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to talk a bit about my experience in the past year uh, implementing React at, uh, at CoBlue. And it was a very interesting journey. Because knowing how to write React and knowing how to write all the code is one thing, but getting your company to adopt and to learn uh, everything is, uh, is a big second. Um, and I would want to do that in three different uh, 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 aspects. The first, I want to talk about why we actually chose React and why I believe React is a, a great technology for a company like CoBlue. But I also want to talk a bit about the, the downsides. And these are not actually downsides of React, but more about everything you get with it. Um, the mental aspect, which is often uh, called JavaScript fatigue recently. And um, now I don't really like the word JavaScript fatigue, but it does show that there is a lot going on. And there are a lot to learn in that aspect. And I also want to talk a bit about the integration part, the technical part of uh, dealing with the, the ecosystem. Well, as I just heard, I'm uh, Paul Van Am, the guy on the the left, um, and I work for Kublu. And we have a very international uh, crowd. So let me first start with a little introduction about Kublu. Um, we are a very rapidly growing company, not just by revenue. Recently, the past few years, it's been going uh, pretty stellar. Uh, but also when it comes to um, uh, hiring developers and hiring extra people, we are currently actually, actually hiring about 10 developers a month. and that gives some interesting challenges to deal with. You can't just endlessly add new, te add new teams uh, because it becomes really hard to manage after a while. Um, so we, uh, we like to uh, look at other tech companies, how they do it. And we recently adopted the, the family model from Spotify, actually. So uh, where we group multiple teams uh, inside a domain family. Um, so you're not only working together uh, with your colleagues in a in a team, you're also working together with teams towards a common goal. Um, but to make a long story short, I um, I joined the Fastest Navigation family about a year ago, and Fastest Navigation basically means everything that has to do with search category pages, and the category page in the end is nothing more than a, a saved search query. Um, and when I came in. Uh, we were redoing a lot of stuff there, and uh, uh, it is actually quite hard to ma to make that manageable for for the end user. Um, the most important part of fast navigation is dealing with filters. Uh, they have to be able to create filters. The filters are uh, dependent on the category you're in. Uh, they have to be able to sort them, uh, turn them on and off. Uh, you have different kind of presentation forms, like uh, uh, like a slider, for example, or a, a to from or just normal. Uh, radio buttons or checkboxes. Um, you might want to group certain uh, uh, values into buckets, like 10 to 20 or 20 to 30, etc. There's a lot of stuff to manage, and it's actually really hard to make that manageable in a in a decent UI. So the first thing that we uh, identified is that we needed something to create uh, uh, a powerful UI that that could uh, do that for our end users. Now a bit of a spoiler alert: it ended uh, ended up being React. Um, but uh, well, why did we choose React? Um, we actually had a behind the scenes event uh, uh, a couple months ago where I also talked about, uh, about our React stack. And um, it was one of, uh, I talked to one of uh, uh, the guys there and he, um, uh, he believed that you didn't even need some sort of library or framework, you could just build everything yourself. Uh, and that's one opinion, of course. And, Facebook has done it. I mean, they created React. I mean, they create everything themselves. But for most companies, that's not really a realistic goal. Um, it's probably a lot smarter to take an existing library or an existing framework to use that. But um, the thing is, in the end, you want to pick the right tool for the right job. But it doesn't really matter what tool you pick. In the end, uh, you can probably reach any end goal or you can reach any result with any of the tools that you pick. It's not that with... Uh, a big framework like Angular, you uh, you will uh, cannot do certain stuff that you can do with React, for example, when it comes to the end user. Uh, 
you probably have the same forms, you have the same interactivity, and you have the same uh, user interface. So the technical aspect is not really that important. Um, what's a lot more important is the journey towards uh, where you want to go. How do you do it, and how does it fit in your uh, how does it fit in your corporate culture, and how does it fit in uh, uh, the way that the company works? Uh, and another um, uh, argument that is heard often is that yeah, uh, that you are already using Angular, for example, you're already using some other framework, and uh, that's what you believe everybody should use. If I ask any of you, then you probably say that I should use React. So in general, we preach what we practice. So you will. Um, but if we look at the, 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 the most common distinction is between the big monolithic framework and the more versatile UE library. But what fits in what kind of culture? And I found that if you, uh, the, the big frameworks are fine in certain kind of cultures. And in general, it's more the, the more ordinary companies or the, uh, the less agile companies, let's put it that way. Um, where there often is a bit less trust, there's more hierarchy, uh, there, there are uh, Bit more risk averse. They want to take less risk risks in the in the choices that they make. It's often a lot more about personal responsibilities. But uh, uh, what's important for them, for, uh, for the people in there, and in an agile environment, there's a lot more trust. Uh, that's why um, you have very autonomous teams. You have very uh, people are willing to take a lot of risks. And with uh, uh, technology like React and everything that comes with it, that bit of trust is what you need. Um, the reusability is in the. Uh, this is uh, a question from an uh, from an interview with a, a developer from uh, Airbnb, and they're also using React. And I really like this answer. Uh, the first part is pretty obvious. I mean, you're working in components, so you can reuse a lot, and you can. Uh, it's very portable. But what I really like is the second part of his answer, and that it's about refactorability, because what you'll be doing a lot in an agile environment is refactoring. Uh, you're iterating a lot on the on the stuff that you're creating, and the next print requirements might have changed, and you will be refactoring a lot again. And you need a tool set, you need a toolkit that uh, facilitates in that continuous uh, iteration. And the second thing is the the JavaScript ecosystem is still pretty volatile, so there's a lot of changes going on there. And if you look at what it was like six months ago, then uh, and we look at it today, then it already has uh, so much has changed already uh, that most companies, if you have like a six or an eight week release cycle, will probably not manage that kind of uh, that kind of dynamic. So in general, uh, you want to have if you're you want to be able to prototype quickly. You want to have uh, fast iterations. You want to have uh, uh, probably have a lot of trust and very autonomous teams. And, and a technology like React is just uh, just perfect for an agile environment. And if we look at some of the bigger uh, tech companies out there, and I put the cool blue logo right in the middle, of course, that'll make at least a few people happy back at the office. Um, but if you look at the, the startup tech companies that use React, then it kind of shows uh, uh, the result of that. It's just, it, it automatically uh, attracts uh, companies like these. Um, Special note for the way by the for companies like PayPal and Salesforce because they're not that agile to begin with, but they really made a turnaround in the past few years, and that's just really amazing. And at the last moment, by the way, I, um, I pasted in the, the little V on the bottom right. I don't know if anybody knows what that logo is from. It's from the, the new Vivaldi browser that was released like one or two weeks ago. And I was pretty amazed when I read that the entire user interface of the browser is actually created in React. I mean, it just shows how incredibly versatile it is. A React itself is pretty straightforward. You can probably learn most of the basics in like one or two hours, and uh, you can you can go from there. But um, in that aspect, it actually mostly reminds me of jQuery, like ten years ago, when working with the DOM was really hard, and jQuery came around, and uh, the first time I downloaded it, and I started playing with it, it was just like, this is so incredibly easy. In like one or two hours, I could do everything I always wanted with uh, with my web pages. Um, and the way that they did that is they basically elevated the use of CSS inside uh, jQuery, and everything was 
uh, selector based. Now, right now we all have the native in our browsers. We have curry selectors, etc. But back then that was really a, a phenomenal thing to do. And with um, it also made it that if you already knew CSS, it was really easy to learn. And it's not much different for for a technology like React. The reason why it's incredibly easy to learn is uh, mainly because, for example, because of JSX. Now, JSX often gets a lot of negative publicity, but so does jQuery. Um, but it's one of the main reasons why uh, React is so easy to learn, because we can, uh, even if we've never written any uh, React or any uh, complex JavaScript at all, uh, it's the JSX part that we recognize. And it's the, the simplicity that eventually just sticks around, and that's what we, uh, uh, that's usually the libraries that, uh, that we'll be using in a long time, for a long time. This is a quote from uh, uh, a great article by Eric Clements. Um, and it's, I think it's actually one of the first times when, uh, when JavaScript fatigue was actually recognized as a, as a thing. Um, because we might have won over the big monolithic frameworks, where you just install one thing and then everything is done. Um, but now we have that incredibly incredible flexibility with the different libraries and different packages, etc. But now we end up with a lot of boilerplate just before we can even start writing some useful code, we have to get a lot of stuff together. Uh, we have to get the build tools, we have to get unit tests, we have to get bundlers, uh, routers, and name it just before you can write some sort of decent app. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you have to get together. Um, this is something that, especially if you're uh, uh, if you're working with uh, developers new to the technology, or if you're yourself new with the technology, can be a really hard thing to overcome, and it's just becoming harder and harder. So I want to look at a few things that um, actually uh, talk about three things about uh, JavaScript fatigue and, and how that works in the teaching process or how that works in the learning process. First of all is, of course, uh, focus. Try not to do too many things at a time. Uh, the first time I did React, and as I said, like in one or two hours, I just knew the basics. The, the second thing that I uh, needed was some sort of uh, state management or uh, data flow thing. So obviously you're going to look into uh, a Flux implementation. And I think there were like 20 or 30 out there that like, my, my motivation went like this pretty quickly. Because just I had to go through 20 or 30 different Flux imp implementations just to get the right one. And I had no idea what I was doing. Luckily, then Abramov's timing was uh, impeccable because he came out with a early version of, uh, of Redux and that's what we have been using ever since. And yeah, focus on the stuff that you really need. Uh, try to stay away from stuff like uh, generators and boilerplates, especially in the early uh, stages. Might be really um, uh, interesting to look at those if you've never uh, get, got anything working together yet. But they give you a lot of stuff, but they don't actually teach you anything. So just take one thing at a time. Second is don't be afraid to fail, and the the first library that I used wasn't actually um, uh, React. I'm almost ashamed to say, but the first library that I uh, played around with was uh, Polymer. Uh, and together with a UX designer, I spent several weeks uh, uh, designing and developing a, a prototype with that because I liked certain aspects of that library. Um, and even gave a talk about Polymer, and that was going to be the next big thing. But uh, eventually, it decided it wasn't going to be. And yes. um, but I threw away, or I had to throw away several weeks of work. And that's something in a lot of environments or in a lot of organizations you will probably never be able to do something like that. Just spend several weeks working on something and just, then just throw it away. Um, also, you will be refactoring a lot, which means you will be failing a lot, etc. cetera. Um, that is a demonstration of my uh, drawing skills. Um, a learning curve isn't a straight curve. A learning curve is one of ups and downs. Uh, and it's really important to facilitate developers in, in that process of learning. Um, you have to support them uh, a bit more passively, probably, when they're still in the learning, uh, uh, learning in, in the up phase. But in their, if they're in the dip, then you probably need to support them a bit more actively. It's, uh, it's an, especially when you're working with uh, technology like React and everything that comes around it. Uh, it's important to keep them uh, focused and keep them motivated. 
if you ever asked anyone about React, uh, the response that you often get is like, yeah, I, I like React and I like components, but I really hate that HTML inside my JavaScript. And that's right. That's the only argument you're going to get. I, I really hate that when that happens, but it all happens a lot. I mean, they're like, they're, they're there. It's not that they're bad developers, but they ended up here and they never got out of it. They're still in that first dip. I never learned why it's a good idea. Perhaps also, they never learned why J6 is a bad idea. It could also be true, but at least it gives you something to talk about. Um, this is a tweet from uh, Dan Abramov. It's also pretty recent from, uh, from last week or so. But basically, it really reflects my sentiment in this. Um, when it, Even in the early days, it was even easier to learn because you could just pick one thing, and just go from there. Uh, but if you have to get into it now, and we don't always realize this because we might already have been doing this for like six months or 12 months or even longer. Uh, but for new developers, it's incredibly, incredibly daunting. So you're not just you're not, not just responsible for building uh, great stuff in, uh, in React and with great stuff with the, uh, the, the most awesome tools out there, but you're also responsible for teaching other developers, for teaching uh, your colleagues that are going to join your team and also going to work with React. You're also responsible for teaching new developers that come in that you hire. Um, I'm also very involved in the hiring process of new developers. And I can guarantee you that the word React is rarely a word in a resume. So you can just, you can all basically always assume that the, the knowledge is, uh, you, you will have to train the people yourself. And even if they know a bit of React, the chance that they will know the exact stack that you have is negligible, basically. Um, from a technical standpoint, we try to, um, uh, facilitate it a bit, this a bit as well by basically just uh, isolating the fatigue a bit into a separate framework. Um, so developers and teams uh, can just create their own modules and they don't have to worry about all the, the build tools and all the developer tools and all the, uh, the unit test setups and everything that goes with it. They can just focus on creating their components, uh, playing around with state, talking to the APIs, etc. They basically can do all the fun stuff while others do all the shitty stuff. But um, the cool thing about this is that people can learn very quickly and they can learn in a very fun way. Uh, uh, and having fun as a developer is incredibly important. Um, oh yeah, I pasted in the snippet, by the way, I have how to do this with Webpack because doing dynamic imports like this is incredibly simple. Uh, and the keyword here is uh, require context. The last uh, thing I want to talk about a bit is the integration part. Um, and then I'm mostly talking about continuous integration because that's basically, again, why you're dealing with the JavaScript ecosystem and trying to get all the build stuff uh, together in a, in a technical way. Uh, this is roughly what we have uh, right now. Now, I'm a front-end developer, so I'm not a DevOps guy, but this is how my mind sees it. Um, when, when we write some code and we create a pull request uh, for that, uh, there's first going to be some ESLint checking if the code is actually some decent quality. Uh, there's also going to be a unit test run for uh, for the code and for, uh, for might be for other code as well. For example, if we uh, uh, if you make changes in the framework, we also want to test all the modules below that. So it just grabs everything together and does a unit test for the entire application. Um, and to run the unit test, we also just do an npm install and just run an npm test and that puts the phantom yes, etc. and all the stuff gets run. And of course, the third step is a, is a human step uh, where a coworker will check your code and uh, see if it's okay. And if, if it's not, the brownie will usually do the trick. And after that, there's a lot of more build stuff going on. Um, and again, there's a lot of npm installing there because we continuously build from source uh, and deploy from there. But there's a uh, there's a big issue in this whole picture. And that issue is mostly with the NPM installs that we do. And to understand why, uh, I want to go a bit into Semver. Uh, you probably already know uh, a lot of this stuff if you're working with uh, uh, with installing packages, etc. Uh, but to get everybody on the same level, I'm going to 
go through this quickly. If you install a, a, a package with a, a, the save command, you get you automatically install it with a caret, which basically means uh, it's compatibility mode. It's uh, uh, the fixed major. Um, so it, if you install any three version, after that it will update to any other three point something version out there. This basically means that all my developers or all our developers could be running with different versions. Um, the, the unit tests could be run with different versions. And the build step could also be running with different versions. That's not really what you want. Uh, that could cause actually a lot of issues. And we had a lot of issues with that uh, a while ago with uh, uh, the Babel ESLint uh, plugin that actually had a dependency that suddenly had a bunch of issues. And that's, those are really hard to fix. It works slightly different, by the way, for the pre release versions, but uh, the idea is the same. Uh, and the idea behind it is that the API should never change. The minor versions uh, should not change the API. They might add some new stuff or they might choose to uh, label something as deprecated, but in general, something should never break uh, if a minor version is released or updated. Um, but this assumes a few things. Uh, first of all, um, it assumes that developers actually follow these rules of versioning. Um, not every developer perhaps knows about the rules or uh, some uh, actively decide to not follow those rules or decide to unpublish all their packages, stuff like that. I mean, developers can be, uh, yes, I, I have a word, but I'm probably not allowed to say it. Um, another assumption that it, uh, uh, that it makes is that releases are always perfect. Now, we probably all write perfect code, but our, our colleagues might not. Um, it's you, you can never guarantee that uh, uh, even though you might say that a minor version should never change an API, uh, in practice, it's gonna it's gonna happen. Something is gonna break on some sort of dependency, and it's gonna happen probably pretty often. Now there are a few ways of fixing this. The first thing I thought, well, just fix the version in my package JSON and everything's fixed, right? But those are just that just works for your dependencies and it doesn't work for your entire dependency tree. Um, the second thing uh, there was actually a bit of a thing uh, last year uh, that was advocated by a lot of developers just checking your entire node modules, uh, then you're always sure that you have all the, the same versions everywhere. But first of all, I really hate having thousands of files and directories under version control because we didn't write them and checking pull requests with changes in your node modules folder, I personally would rather not. Um, but there's a bigger issue here, and that's uh, node modules folders can actually be uh, platform dependent. Uh, if you run stuff like Lipsos or Phantom ES, those are platform, in, uh, platform dependent. And if you have developers running on Windows, and you have developers running on OS X, and uh, our build steps are actually in Linux, then checking in node modules does only break stuff. So that doesn't really work either. Um, Proper solution here is to use uh, shrink wrap in uh, in npm, and that's basically mandatory for anything that you want to do. Uh, if you have uh, uh, dynamic builds, uh, and it basically saves the JSON file of your entire uh, dependency tree and all the versions in it, and it guarantees that all developers and the entire build process runs the same versions of the entire uh, the entire tree. Again, this won't fix uh, developers on publishing their uh, um, their their packages. But honestly, that's an issue that was an NPM. It is not really an issue that we should fix in code. And luckily, they fixed it in several hours. So, uh, yep. Now, there are a few things that I want to look at in the future. Uh, uh, we have a really great stack running, and it's really uh, awesome to work with it. And it's awesome to to uh, to get new developers involved in this as well, because usually they really like working with it, and they really love the whole. Uh, uh, way of working in JavaScript. Uh, we have some old module replacement uh, running right now, but uh, there's been a lot of going on on that front recently, and uh, we would like to revisit that, uh, make it a bit more powerful. This is uh, old module replacement makes it so that you don't actually have to re refactor or you have to uh, uh, refresh your entire application every time something changes, and that's really annoying if you have a big app with a lot of state because you lose all that state. Um, so that's a really, it's one of those really sort of quality of life features of uh, uh, for developers, which I think is really important. Because again, developers should have fun in uh, what they do. 
Uh, of course, React 15 was just released. Webpack 2 is around the corner. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. And uh, we just heard Jack talking about Enzyme. And that's also actually one of the things that we're looking into. Um, the first thing that we started was with Karma and Phantom ES yes, because that's the most obvious thing to do because you want to render your components into documents and see the outcome, etc. But unfortunately, it is an extremely slow process. Uh, starting the Phantom ES yes browser for every test uh, or for every test process that you want to run uh, is actually really slow. And Karma is also isn't the fastest out there. Um, so we're looking into a, a, a new stack for Ava and Enzyme. So we don't have to run Phantom ES yes anymore. And also, Ava makes it possible that you can run multiple tests in parallel. So it's a really huge speed increase. I have a few minutes left for questions. So thank you for listening.